I'm Lisa, the artist behind La Cree Fine Art. Today's video is one you guys have been requesting for a really long time. In this video, I'm going to give you some beginner tips for airbrushing and then do a demonstration on airbrushing flames. This painting is actually a two-parter. Today, we are going to be learning or doing a tutorial just on the flames, and then next week is going to be the full video, which is going to be a demonstration with painting Katniss herself. To start with, I'm gonna go over some of the supplies that I use. For this painting, I ended up painting this on a Fredericks, one of their black canvas pads. These are really nice. They're just pads of paper and I just taped it to another surface to paint on. And for this one, because it's not something that I'm going to be selling because of copyright issues, that means I'm going to end up hanging on to this painting for years and years and years. And I have so many canvases that are stored and they take up a lot of space when you have that as many as I do. So painting on this surface is kind of nice because it stores flat or I can roll it up or whatever, but it doesn't take up a lot of space. And it is still, you're still working on a Fredericks canvas, so you still have the same texture. This one is a medium texture, so that's really nice. Plus it was already painted black, which I needed, so it was just all around convenient for me. A lot of airbrush artists, though, prefer something much, much smoother. Even me, if I'm doing something that I'm going to sell, I like a smoother surface. This one does have a bit more tooth, and so you are gonna see some of the grain of the canvas more than if you used a smoother surface to paint on. But because I was doing for Katniss herself, I ended up using traditional brushwork mixed with the airbrush. I wanted something that had a little bit of tooth. I didn't wanna paint on uh, some, of the, some of the artboards that a lot of artists like to use because those absorb paint with the paint brush really weird. They're great for airbrush, but they absorb paint with paintbrush a little bit odd. So this is why I went with this painting, with this canvas, whatever. The next thing, and I want to point out, I don't like, I don't personally airbrush something completely airbrushed all in its own. I always mix it with traditional paint. Uh, brush work. I just prefer that myself. It's how I like to paint. So the, the tools that I use may not be the tools that somebody would ideally like if they were doing things solely with airbrushing by itself. So just something to keep in mind. Now when I do mix airbrushing with traditional brush work, the acrylic paint that I use is Liquitex Basics. This I like because it has a fairly flat finish so the airbrush sticks to it really really well. If you use a brand of paint that has a higher gloss, the airbrush that you do over it can kind of scratch off of it or be removed. It, it just doesn't stick real well. So with me, I definitely prefer Liquitex Basics. It's the only one that I use when I'm mixing that with airbrushing. Next is the actual airbrush paint itself. I personally really like the Createx because they have so many colors that are very opaque. They've got a lot of opaque and translucent. But this works really, really well with the, the brush work that I like to do. It just mixes well. It sticks to the canvas really well, even when I water it down. This paint is very thick, and it tends to clog airbrushes, especially if you've got a finer needle. So with me, I use quite a bit of water with it. Now, they don't recommend you use water. They like you to use their mixing medium, but it's still a bit thick for me. I definitely prefer water. You do have to watch if you're using water. A couple things. One, the more water you use, the less adhesive the paint is. And that's true with any, like, even if you're using traditional brush work with with acrylic paint. Um, it makes it more translucent and makes it less adhesive. So you don't wanna go crazy with the water there. The other thing is, it's going to be a lot slower to dry. The mixing mediums that they mix with the, or thin a lot of the airbrushing paints down, I don't know if it's an alcohol or what they have, based on whatever they have in it, it dries much faster. With this, with because I'm using so much water on some of these, I have to take a hair dryer in between every couple of layers and dry it all the way just so that the paint doesn't start running if I get it on there too heavy. So another thing that you wanna watch if you're adding water to this, don't go overboard with it. The Createx is a pretty thick paint and it does clog a lot of airbrushes. So I do spend a fair amount of time unclogging my airbrush and cleaning it out completely as I work. They do have a cleaner though that they make that I love. It's really inexpensive and it works so well. And I will list all of these supplies with links below in the video description. So if you miss what I'm saying, cause I know I talk too fast, if you miss something, it'll be down there so you can read all about it. Another type of airbrush paint that a lot of artists really like is Calm Art and that one does not clog my airbrush ever. It is more translucent and I don't like how it mixes well with the traditional brush work that I like to do. That stuff will come right off. Like if I use wet paint on top of it, it will lift everything off that I've just done. So it just doesn't play as nice together with doing the traditional work. But again, because that's how I like to paint, I don't use it too often. And it is a good paint. It doesn't clog like the Createx tends to because it is so thin. And most of their colors are really translucent. So it's not ideal for me, but like I said, great paint. Moving on to the templates. I get asked about this one all the time. So I'm gonna start with this. When I do my space scenes, you guys see me use this one a lot. This is called FX Texture. It's by Freehand Airbrush Templates. It comes with three of the, the spacey type look ones that I use. They call them Organic, Master, and Cosmic. And they've got different shapes and patterns. I use these 
all the time like for years I've had this set for probably three or four years it's one of the more pricey airbrush templates that I have but definitely definitely worth it I so get my use out of it if you're doing space scenes this gives a great great look the next in my templates thing it really isn't a template this one is a type of airbrush guard kind of like a French curve but not exactly it's got curves for some different things that you can use I use this one when I do stuff like her jaw here where I wanted a harsher line you can use this and hold it up against there just to keep keep some of your lines a bit cleaner this one is also by freehand airbrush templates this one is called the 360 shield Richard Mont Montoya and when you're airbrushing you don't have to use templates they're just a handy handy thing to get texture very very easily next on my list are my circles I use these for planets and stars and stuff like that all the time I've got them in a few different sizes and I've got tons of these because I have a tendency to lose them and end up having to go and buy more so I have a ridiculous amount of circle templates but very very handy oh Look, see, there's another random circle template. They're all over my room. Next, I have a whole lot of different grunge looks. I don't even know what this is called. I got it on eBay. This one's by Stencil Pros. But they have stuff like this on eBay, and you can get different grungy, broken looks. I use them a lot for backgrounds. Speaking of grunge templates, I have a ton by Air Stencils. Air Airstick, I know the name. Airstick.com, again, link will be below, below in the video description. I've gotten crazy buying stencils from them because they have some that give you just such a cool look. Very, very different, sketchy, my finger is stuck in my stencil. Very sketchy, different looks. I think I have most of theirs they've made from their grunge series. I love them all. Keep in mind, when you're using most of these stencils, you're not trying to get necessarily a completely natural look. Besides the ones that I use for my space scenes, those ones do have a more natural look to them. But a lot of these, if you overdo the stencils you have to know that the intent is not to have a natural look if you want a natural look avoid the stencils some of the guards and guides are helpful but overdoing the stencils can definitely take away from your work next on my list is another one from air stick stencils this these are how I create flames so for this video really really handy some of the French curves you can use for that but these ones give you some really nice interesting shapes uh, and this you're going to see me use, or all of these you're going to see me use a lot in the video. These ones are called Arson Real Fire. And I've got I, the small and large set of these. But this is how I always do fire. I love this set. Next are my airbrushes themselves. I have two that I use. My first airbrush that I bought about 15, 16 years ago, that one is a Tamiya, Tamiya, something like that. But that one has a bigger needle. It's a 0.5 millimeter. My airbrush that I'm using in this video is my Iwata, ne my Iwata Neo. This one has a 0.35 five millimeter needle so it's going to be easier for getting finer detail but it also has a tendency to clog a little bit more when using that thicker createx paint so plus and negatives there my air compressor weighs a ton and so i'm only going to show you for a second so you can kind of see how what size it is there it is there the label on that one says that it's a sim air i bought it about 15 or 16 years ago and i think they changed the name on it because when i did a google search on it it's coming up as storm force and the storm force one looks exactly the same to me but it's a 15 year old compressor. It's been really good. I've had to change the hoses on it a couple of times, but that was easy enough to figure out. Okay, now onto the actual tips. I'm going to be using my Iwata Neo for this demonstration. And the Neo's a nice airbrush. It's very inexpensive. I think I paid like $60 for it, but then I had a 40% coupon, so it didn't cost much. And it's been a really good airbrush. I've had to replace the needle a couple of times because I'm dumb and don't take care of it like I should. And a couple of other parts, but the parts are easy to get because they are carried at Hobby Lobby and they're pretty inexpensive. So for this one, it is a dual action airbrush. And if you're going to be doing paintings where the whole thing's being done in airbrush or most of it's being done in airbrush, you want a dual action one. You don't want the cheap hobby kits where it's a single action where you can only push down and not push control how far you push down or how far you pull back. This dual action means it means I can push down to control how much air is coming out and pull back to control how thick or thin or how much paint is actually coming out of the airbrush. Couple things with this. You know how you watch on TV and the gangster guys are holding a gun and they're holding it sideways and they're all, you know, I'm gangsta, I'm cool. Yeah, don't do that with the airbrush. Same concept, just like with them where they're holding it stupid. You can't aim as well with a gun if you're holding it like an idiot. So you, same concept with the airbrush gun. You want to hold it a very specific way. You don't want to be tipping it as you're painting going upside down and all over the place. You want to keep it very straight, keep it even. If you need to steady your hand, you can use both hands for that especially when you're doing fine detail and it's going to be very awkward at first it's one of those things it takes practice it is not something that overnight you're going to be a pro spend a lot of time practicing you can write your name you can you know whatever you want make what they call dagger strokes where you're going from thick to thin and then thick to thin to thick lines practice doing 
pretty much nothing, just getting a feel for the airbrush and getting used to having it in your hand. But hang on to it and have it pointing directly at your canvas and directly in front of you. You're not gonna be painting all over here and you know, the loose wrist thing. I see people do that a lot, bad habit. You wanna keep it right in front of you and move. Like say you're painting the whole background, move with your airbrush as you're moving around. Don't do this limp wrist thing or painting sideways. Think idiot gangster holding their, their gun sideways. You do not have the control you need with that. Your aim is going to be terrible. Be centered, be even, hold it even. Now, say you're painting a whole background. You wanna make sure if you're, this is the edge of your canvas, don't stop here and go back over. You end up with hot spots along that edge. Go off the canvas and then back over off the canvas and back over. So something else to keep in mind, this look where you're just sketching back and forth like this, all messy if you're filling in your background, you're gonna get, have a lot of hot spots. It's not gonna be even. If you're trying to get an even look, you wanna go all the way across and then all the way across again. I mean, you, you practice basically. Next, and this is the best tip that I can give someone starting off with airbrushing. When you start off, a lot of people think, push down, pull back, let go. I'm painting, I'm painting, I'm pushing down, I'm pulling back to control how much paint. I'm done painting that stroke, I let it go. Not the way to do it. What you wanna do, and you wanna spend some time, really get in the habit of doing it this way. You push down, you pull back, push forward, and let it let the air keep coming out, pushing forward before you lift your finger off. The reason for this is you're pushing down, that's the air. Pulling back lets out paint. If you drop it there without pushing forward again, you just drop it while you've been pulling back, you will clog your airbrush. Down, you're letting air come out, pull back, there's your paint, you're done making that stroke. Push forward, let the air shoot out alone, so it's just air shooting out at that point, which is essentially kind of cleaning the paint out of the little nozzle, let up. This is something, push down, pull back, push forward, let up. Do that over and over and over again, and it's so boring, but it is a habit you need to get into. And that's not to say your airbrush isn't gonna clog anyway, especially if you're using the th thicker Createx paint, but this is going to help a ton. The difference is huge, doing that versus not doing that. It is a habit that you wanna get into. And it seems like you're doing this weird extra step, but it'll get to the point where you do it without thinking about it. Like, I don't even realize that I'm doing it most of the time. It's just habit. Push down, pull back, push forward, let up. Next, for cleaning your airbrush, what I like to do if I've got a lot of thick paint in there or a lot that I need to clean out, especially with black and white, I will usually take this to a sink and flush water through it really good and then flush water back, hook it back up to my airbrush and or the compressor and then feed a lot of water through it and then feed my actual airbrush cleaner through it to get it really clean. Again, the airbrush cleaner that I'm using is one made by Createx. Another thing, they have a guard on the front here that you can take off. So you've just got the needle. I will usually personally paint without this guard. And that way, these guards sometimes, especially with me, because I am mixing water, that water will build up because it doesn't dry right away. Like if I were using a normal mixing medium, it will build up and it ends up splattering onto my canvas. So I will usually remove this. The other thing is sometimes, especially Createx, because it is thicker, it will build up a little bit of paint on that needle and you can just take your fingernail and pull that right back off. Here's the thing, if you're gonna do this, that needle has to be perfectly, perfectly straight. If you bend your needle, Needle, it sprays sideways or doesn't spray at all right but I mean you end up where you're trying to have control and your paints coming out to the side don't bend your needle be careful with it the real negative to taking that off is that you're more likely to bend the needle but I don't like painting with it on so just be careful so I think that's about it for my first tips now we are going to get into the actual painting of flames now when you paint flames I kept mine pretty toned down because this is just the background for a portrait and I didn't want them too distracting I have new painting and drawing videos every Wednesday so make sure you subscribe and follow me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Tumblr and all those fun social media sites link below in the video description to keep up with news and my newest work. Head back next week where this video will be completed with the actual painting of Katniss herself. Now we can get into the actual tutorial. I'll see you guys next week. I'm starting off freehanding my general shapes of the flames. I'm using the darkest of my orange red colors for this. No stencils are used for this first step to make sure that the shapes are kept very loose. I'm keeping mine very soft because I don't want my flames too defined given that they're going to be the background for a portrait. If I were not painting them as a background, I would define them a bit more throughout the piece. Step two is when I first start using my stencils. These are the Arson set from Airstick stencils that I talked about earlier. With this second step, I'm still keeping my lines fairly soft. My harshest lines will be at the very end. For this step, I'm using a lighter orange than I did in my first layer.
It is important to get a lot of variation in your flame shapes as you work. You don't want them all shaped the same. Because I knew I would be painting Katniss on the right of this piece, I did leave a big section blank. I used a lot of white in my last yellow layer so that it would show up well against my orange tones behind it. My yellow is a very translucent color, so the white was used so that I would get better coverage. I then used straight yellow over that to give it a richer tone, followed by a bit of orange to tone it back down some more. Again, being that this is considered a background for a portrait, I didn't want everything too harsh. I came back through again with a bit of white just to sharpen up a few sections on different spots. I then toned them down again with some yellow ochre. I wanted to keep it pretty soft, but I didn't want to completely lose my flame shape. The very last thing I did for mine was to use a brick red color to hype up my contrast a little bit, just for the darker areas. This step isn't necessary if you don't go overboard with your lighter oranges in the first place like I did. The paint that I'm using is pretty forgiving of mistakes because it is so opaque, so it's easy enough to go back and forth with, and do this sort of touch up. That's one of the things that I do really like with using the more opaque colors with the Createx. And that's it. There are tons and tons of different styles of flames that you can paint. So I suggest doing a Google image search to find the look that you're going for as reference on your own project. The layering is essentially done the same no matter what shape or style of flame you're going for. It's just a matter of the actual shape and how much contrast you get in your flames. Don't forget to head back next Wednesday to see the full video of the painting with Katniss herself. Thanks for watching and I will see you guys next week.